Well, let's just begin today with a, a reminder that we are in a series called Dust. When Jesus was calling his disciples, the word isn't, we, we've translated disciple, not a bad word, but the word is Talmudin in the Hebrew, and it meant apprentice. Jesus was saying, I want you to follow me. And the invitation was an invitation of a lifetime because it was to follow the rabbi. And there's this saying that came up somewhere around the first century that the, the Talmudin, the disciples, the apprentices were, caught, were following so close to their rabbi that the dust of the road would fall on the rabbi's students or his apprentices. And this is what we believe, that Jesus tells his disciples, his apprentices, follow me. Do what I do. Say what I say and walk in my ways. And so we've been on a journey together of looking at these seven principles of what it looks like to follow Jesus. And in the last few weeks, we've just been looking at some interactions that Jesus had with people. And this week, we're going to look at an interaction that Jesus had with Mary and Joseph. <clears throat> Excuse me. World War II has ended. It's September 2nd of 1945. Six million Jewish people were brutally murdered and thousands upon thousands were displaced. And there's people that had been taking Jewish children and hiding them in places all throughout Europe. And in 1945, there's this rabbi, his name is Eleazar Silver. And he decides that he wants to head up the search to find these displaced Jewish children and try to put them back with their families. Children had been hidden from the Nazis in farms. They had been hidden from the Nazis at convents. They had been hidden from the Nazis in people's homes and in monasteries. And Rabbi Silver has this desire to see these young Jewish children returned to their families. In late 1945, the rabbi has this promising lead of this monastery in southern France that had taken in Jewish children to hide them from the Nazis. Uh, upon his re arrival, the, the priest is rather reluctant about whether or not he has any Jewish children in his monastery. And the rabbi doesn't know what to do. These children were toddlers when they were ripped away from their homes and when they were hidden. How would he know if any of them came from Jewish families? The rabbi Silver does something interesting. He says, hey, can, can I just walk through the ward where all of the children are? And he's walking and he goes, how will I know if any of these kids are Jewish? Because the priest said, as far as I'm concerned, all these kids are Christian. As he's walking through, he doesn't know what to do, and he sees all of these kids. And he begins to do this. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu. Adonai, God. And he sees these little children, some of them, their eyes start to light up. And then they begin to sing with him. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. The rabbi began to sing the most famous passion passage of the Torah. Hear, O Israel. The Lord, our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your might. These children had been displaced for years, but the familiarity of the Shema still was in their hearts. Why? Because the Jewish parents as soon as a child could begin to speak, would be taught the Shema. They would teach their kids the sacred text that's found in the Torah, 
the Torah is the first five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And in Deuteronomy chapter 6, there is the Shema. See, the prayers of this treasured text of what we believe are the very words of God should be the foundation of every home that is following Jesus and needs to be the foundation of your life as well. If you have your Bibles, and and I hope you do, will you stand to your feet and turn to Luke chapter 2? We love to just stand just to honor the reading of God's Word. Luke is a physician, more than likely a slave. You're like, doctors were slaves? Yeah, about half of them were. And they were indentured servants, and they were to follow somebody that needed medical attention. This guy follows a man named Paul. Luke gives us an account or record of Jesus' life. It's known as the Gospels. The Gospels are the first four books of the New Testament. Your Bible is broken up into two halves, and there's really not two halves, but there's the Hebrew Bible that many people call the Old Testament, and then there's the New Testament that's filled with accounts of Jesus, and then some letters to the very early church. So we're going to look at something that Luke recorded for us, and I'm so glad he did. And this story is found in verse 41 of chapter 2. This is Jesus. Now, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast had ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it. But supposing him to be in the group that they were a day's journey, but then they had began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And Jesus said to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know I must be in my father's house? The King James says, I must be about my father's business. And they did not understand the saying that he had spoke to them. And he went down to with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. This ends the reading of God's word. Can I pray over us? Blessed are you, Father. We worship you today. We thank you for an opportunity to give you praise, to make like declarations, to, to affirm our covenant relationship with you. We thank you for your son, Jesus, our king and our master. Father, I pray that today we would learn what it means to be a people of your book, to love your sacred text, to worship you through the study of scripture. Father, transform our lives. Lord, I just pray that the meditation of my heart and the words of my lips bring glory and honor to you and to you alone. And we ask all this in our king, master Jesus' name. And all of God's favorite people said... Now listen, I don't know what kind of mistakes that you have made in the past, but Mary and Joseph lost Jesus, okay? I'm just saying, I don't know what kind of week you've had, but I don't know if you lost Jesus. They left Jesus at church. Now, uh, you guys know I'm a pretty transparent person. I try to be an open book. So full disclosure, a little bit of confession here. A few months ago, Ashley and I were almost at home when Lucas calls. He says, where are you? I'm like, almost home. Where are you? He says, still at the church. Um, now, one, Lucas is not the son of God, okay? So, I'm, all right? And, and, and full confession, he usually writes home with Lee or Bowley, okay? So it's not like I just left him, okay? But um, my, there, there could be an inference here in, in the scripture that life isn't what it's supposed to be when you just leave Jesus at church and don't take him home with you. Now, although that's not today's sermon, that'll preach. Jesus, like those young Jewish children from the story from 1945, would have learned the Shema at a very, very young age. Joseph 
would have taught him the Shema. I think it's peculiar. We, as Protestants, you know, we, people start talking about Mary, and we're like, whoa, hold on now, hold on, hold on now. I just want to remind you of all of the people, all of the married couples, of all of the centuries, the Father in heaven entrusted the Son of God with Mary and Joseph. I'm not telling you to pray to her, but I think you should probably show her some honor and respect. <laughs> Joseph and Mary would have taught Jesus the Torah. It would have taught them the words of God at a very young age. It's so funny we, as we teach and our kids the scripture, you could ask them today, and they wouldn't even know that it's the Bible. <laughs> like we, we try to tell them. I'm talking about the, the little ones, okay? It, it's so funny how culture impacts our children. Last uh, couple weeks ago, I, I got to spend some time with the family, and, we're, and I'm hanging around, and, and, and we just had you know, some time away. And I'm with Silas, and he falls, and he goes, oh, biscuits. I'm like, what, is, what biscuits? I'm like, you're watching way too much Bluey if you're quoting the Australian word for trouble. And it, 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 it just reminded me how everything is discipling our children. Culture is discipling your children. You are being discipled by culture. You're being discipled by the music you listen to. You're being discipled by what you watch and what you read. Everything. Now, as a young teenager, I was about 16 and a half years old, and uh, I had CDs. For those of you who don't know what a CD is, boy, are you missing out, okay? And I was around when there were tapes. If you don't know what tape is, you don't know how important a pencil was to having a cassette tape, okay? You just, you've never lived. I come home from school, and I go up the stairs, and across my bed are broken CDs everywhere. My entire collection. I had worked for. I come running down the steps. I am on a hunt for my little brother, my younger brother. He is not little anymore. He's a giant of a man. I think he might be part Nephilim, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> and I, I'm looking for him, and my mom says, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm looking for Randy. She goes, what are you looking for Randy for? She goes, he broke all my CDs and put them all over my bed. And she said, I did that. <laughs> Let's just say my mom did not have the same affinity for hip hop and rap music that I did, okay? I am 46 years old. That was 30 years ago. And I can still put on Tupac. And I know every word. Uh, I've not listened to Biggie in 20-something years. And by that, I mean the CDs, y'all, okay? Every once in a while on a date night, we just kind of do a little set list of cool stuff from the 90s. You're like, there was cool stuff in the 90s? Thank you. That's what I'm waiting for that. I set myself up for that joke. Every word. See, culture, music, the books, it's, it, we're constantly being discipled. It is so important for us to take in this sacred text because culture tells us that we're alone and that we're worthless and we'll never match up to anything. And the word of God says, no, you are loved. You are chosen. You are called by name. You are holy. You are acceptable. You are mine. So we constantly have to let the text the words of God to shape what we know. It would be impossible to overstate the importance of the Torah to the Jewish people. And it would be impossible to overstate the importance of the Hebrew Bible to Jesus. The Jewish people have long been known as the people of the book. And it might be better said that they are the people who exegeted the book. 
Ezra chapter 7, verse 10 is one of the first times we see this show up in Scripture. It says this, For Ezra had set his heart, or he had resolved to study and interpret the law of the Lord and to practice it and teach his statutes and ordinances in Israel. Dear friends, we live now in the West. Everything in our education system is a Greco-Roman form of understanding. What it means is that you gather the information so that you can pass the test. That's not the way of Jesus. It's not so you can say the books of the Bible. It's not so you know the famous passages. It's so that you can be transformed by the text. It's not enough just to read it. We have to practice it. We learn one, we obey one. We learn one thing, we do that one thing. Ezra said, I, I, I want to practice it. Ezra said, I want to I wanna live it out. And, and most scholars suggest that this might be the earliest reference to exegeting Scripture, to expound it, to interpret it. And people say, well, we are freed from the law. Dear friends, that is a horrible and gross mistranslation of the way that Jesus understood Torah. The word law would be better translated teaching or guidance. Every Christian I know is like, well, we should keep the top ten. Well, nine of them because I don't want a Sabbath. The law was never meant to be seen as a divine set of rules, but loving direction for the people of God. When God commissions Joshua after the death of Moses to take the land, this is what he says in Joshua chapter 1. Be strong and courageous, For you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give to them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do all, be careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn your from it to the right or to hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book, the, the book of the law, the holy scriptures, the Bible shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you shall be careful to do all according to what was written in it. For then you will make your ways prosperous and then you will have good success. Some of us are living in fear and some of us are living in the opposite of prosperity and it's because we're not walking in the ways of the Lord. Meditate on it day and night. What might sound cumbersome to you today in this industrialized world was the invitation of a lifetime to uncover God's very thoughts. When you open this treasured text, you are uncovering the thoughts of God. The psalmist puts it this way. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. We learn the value of the treasured text. Listen, I'm not here to place a burden upon you, but I think it's really important that we are just honest with ourselves. So this is my question to you. What if we approach the thoughts of God, the treasured text, the holy scriptures, just like we do our phones? What might it look like if we did this? Why don't you turn your eyes to the screen? Uh, Paul, have you got the burble sing clip lined up? Uh, yeah, sure, I'll have it ready in a minute. Cheers. <sighs> What's 
Man. Buffering. Oh yeah, come on, try it over here. Got a better signal. What if we started to treat the sacred text, the words of God, like we do our, so our phones? Now, if you're new around here to the men and women of the house, this is my request as your pastor. I, I, I've said this so many times, and I will say it so many times more. When you are reading your Bible at home, do not read the Bible on your phone. Let your children see you with an open Bible in hand. They don't know that you're on TikTokery or Instagram or Facebook or checking the NCAA basketball scores. They do not know. They need to see you with an open Bible in hand. The gospel, the epistles, revelation, the New Testament as we call it, Every one of those books assume a very intimate familiarity with the Hebrew Bible or with the Old Testament. In my humble opinion, the primary misapplication of the New Testament in people who do not fully grasp what Jesus said is because they do not see the New Testament through the lens of the Hebrew Bible or first century Judaism, or second temple theology. There's an author named Louis Toberg, and this is what she suggests. Our storybook Bible split the text into short morality lessons. So we assume that's how we should read the text as adults, but it's actually not meant to be a collection of simple children's stories. It is a sophisticated epic saga with a complex interwoven plot. It's so much more beautiful than anything C.S. Lewis ever penned, although I love most of what he's read, wrote, writ, wrote, writ, whatever. <laughs> it, it, it's supposed to be an epic saga that rivals this, the second most popular book ever sold, The Lord of the Rings. We should marvel at the text. There's a pastor named, most people know him by A.W. Pink, but his name was Arthur Pink, and this is what he said. The Bible does not yield its meaning to a lazy people. When we study the text, we, we, we live in the text. Listen, friends here, listen, I'm not, this is not about guilt and condemnation today. This is an invitation of a lifetime to understand the words of God. Like, think about that. The very words of God, this treasured text, should form and transform us. There's a guy named Saul, known as Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, over half. Paul was not a follower of Jesus. Matter of fact, he tried to, to destroy what was known as the way in the beginning. He hated the people that were following Jesus. He murdered men. He imprisoned women and children. He did not like this thing called the church. He has a radical conversion. It's in the gospel or the book of Acts. It's actually Luke volume two. It's called Acts of the Spirit or Acts of the Apostles. And you can read about his a radical transformation at your leisure. It's in Acts 7, 8, and 9, and you can read his story. But he then begins to devote his life to the church. And he writes these letters, and he starts to apprentice men and women and show them the ways of Jesus. And one of his young disciples, or one of his young apprentices, was a guy named Timothy. And he wrote Timothy this letter to him. 
And this is in his second letter to him at 2 Timothy chapter 3. And this is what he says. For all scripture is God breathed. The Amplified says given by divine inspiration and is profitable for instruction, for conviction of sin, for correction of error and restoration towards obedience, for training in righteousness or learning to live in conformity to God's will, both publicly and privately, behaving with honor and personal integrity and moral courage so that the man of God and woman of God may be complete and proficient, outfitted and thoroughly equipped for every good work. How can you live? How can I live in a way that's pleasing to God if I'm not sitting in the text, the treasured text, the divinely inspired words of God written for our understanding from this God who is love. To understand the text, we we need to read with the conviction that he, God, has inspired or has written every word. To understand the heart of God, the treasured text, the word of God, it is the very reason in which you were created to know the loving God. The reason that you exist is to know God. The reason you exist is to be known by God. The reason you exist is to make this God known. To know him. To be known by him. And to make him known. And I'll be honest. I know that the scriptures don't answer every one of life's questions. And in our Greco-Roman mind, we need an answer for every question. And if not an answer, at least give me multiplication, right? I scored a pretty decent score on my ACT. And uh, this is what I did. Abacadabba. I'm not making this up. A-B-A-C-A-D-A-B-A-C-A-D-A-B. I didn't want to take the test, okay? Now, guys, if you've not taken that, I'm not suggesting that you do that, okay? Okay. We treat life like it's a test to gather information. We treat the word of God like it's just for me to get the answers to the test. And it's to know him. To know the love of the Father. I, I, I think it's interesting as created beings, we, we, we need an answer to everything. And from a Hebraic understanding of the way of Jesus there's this idea that like, hey, some things only God knows. And we're okay with that. As created beings, created in the image of God, we, we just accept that God doesn't answer our every doubt or explain every question to our satisfaction. We find ourselves like in this place where we just want to know him. Isaiah 55, Isaiah was a prophet in the, in the Hebrew Bible, and this is what he says. He says, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Oftentimes, walking in the wisdom of God is having the humility to say, I don't know. But God knows all things. I don't fully understand why he allowed me to carry this burden, but he does. I don't know why he's allowing this present suffering in my life, but he does. I don't know why bad things happen to good people and good things happen to bad people, but he does. And this this maybe not having all the answers, it should never remove our desire to live in the treasured text to uncover the very thoughts of God. I love what Jesus says. Why were you looking for me? Didn't you know I was going to be in my father's house? Why are you looking for me? Didn't you know I was supposed to be about my father's business? One of the problems with modern Christians is we have this wrong view of God. We say stuff like, well, the God of the Old Testament is not the same as the God of the New Testament. In the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, God is a bloodthirsty war criminal. Where in the New Testament, God is peace and love. And we've created this wrong view or a poor understanding of the God of the Bible. 
I'm just going to go ahead and address one of the biggest questions that I get all the time. People ask me, well, Pastor Ronnie, why doesn't God get rid of all of evil? Why don't you define evil? What do you mean? Murders? Criminals? Child slavery? I just can't understand why God lets any of that exist. What Jesus says, if you have hatred in your heart towards somebody, you've committed murder. If you don't like child slavery, but we're all really comfortable wearing sneakers that we know are made in child slave factories and carrying an iPhone that we know, or any cell phone, by the way, I'm, not, I'm an equal opportunist defender here, okay? Any cell phone that realizes that the, what's inside that cell phone, the only way that happens is through familial generation slavery that's taking place. The truth is we just want to get rid of that evil and we refuse to take responsibility for the evil we tolerate. So why doesn't God get rid of all of evil, dear friends? Because he'd have to start with you. Why doesn't God get rid of all of evil? Because he would have to start with me. What restrains him? What restrains his wrath? The word in the Hebrew is his hesed. It's his mercy, his loving kindness. I know that there is evil in the world, and I want you to know that God is not indifferent about it, but he is patient with it. God does not allow evil. He is merciful. And lucky for me, and lucky for you, the Bible says that God is slow to anger. Author Jurgen Morton, he makes this suggestion. A God who cannot suffer is poorer than any human. For God who is incapable of suffering is a being who cannot be involved. Suffering and injustice do not affect him. And because he is so completely insensitive, he cannot be affected or shaken by anything. He cannot will, for he has no real. For the one who cannot suffer cannot love either. So he is a loveless being. And lucky for you and I, the Bible says that our God mourns. Our God gets angry. Our God gets jealous. I remember the first time I read that God was a jealous God. Can I just be honest? As a teenager, I was like, well, that's a pretty petty emotion for the creator of the universe. The dude's up there getting jealous. I was young and I, I was naive. And I remember thinking jealousy, like that's what God is. Who gets jealous? Is God jealous like a, a scorned lover? <laughs> is God jealous over the envy or the promotion of another? Was God jealous when somebody else gets what he wanted? Like I didn't understand this benevolent, omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent, providential, righteous, and holy God is jealous for you. It's jealous for me. It didn't make sense. And then I got married. And then I had kids. <laughs> Being a husband and a father impacted my understanding of jealousy. See, when God has this emotion of jealousy for you, the reason he wants your attention more than he wants you to give your attention to TikTok or a book or a movie or social media is because his jealousy is a departure of love. The Hebrew word for jealousy describes the anger of God from a departed love. So God's jealousy really is love in action. It's, it's, he, he knows what's best for you. He wants to lead and guide you. It's, it's why we are to stay connected to him. It's not as much as you and I would define as selfish jealousy, as much as God reveals himself as a devoted lover. It's in his benevolence that he has real compassion for you. 
It is in his omniscience where he provides direction for you. It is in his omnipotence that he gives you strength. It is in his providence that he provides you purpose. It is in his righteousness that he has offered himself for you. And it is in his holiness that he died on the cross for you. It's by his very nature. God desires what is best for you. And that separation is the driving force of his love. In the first few pages of the Hebrew Bible or in the Torah, in the book of Genesis, we see this creation out of control. We see sex with angels, Nephilim, whole nother sermon. If you want more on that, you can buy me a good cup of coffee. We see man doing everything that their wicked heart desires. Depravity. Every imagination of continued evil is what the text. It brings God to this moment where he is regret creating man. And was God filled with unflinching judgment? Was God ready to pour out his wrath on the flood? Now, Genesis 6 says this, the Lord regretted that he had made mankind on the earth and he was deeply grieved in his heart. Pain, grief, deeply wounded was the God of covenant. Dear friends, the God of covenant, the covenantal God doesn't happen at Abraham. We see before Abraham that there were sacrifices happening. We see before then that you're supposed to honor the Sabbath and and take a day of rest. God sees what it's going to cost. Our sin cost him greatly. In Scripture, the Father grieves over sinfulness. Jesus grieves at heart and heart's The Holy Spirit grieves at sin. And I would just dare say there cannot be grief without genuine love. He is affectionate towards you. And that's why the psalmist said this in Psalms 119. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments I have stored up your words in my heart. God grieves. God's heart can be wounded. The Bible says we can quench, we can grieve, and we can blaspheme the Holy Spirit. We quench the Holy Spirit when we stifle what God is trying to do in our doubt, in our rejection of what he wants to do through you because you think you've been disqualified. You don't think you're holy enough. And God says, do not grieve my heart by thinking I can't use you and take your brokenness and use it for my glory. We grieve the heart of God when we continue to walk in unfaithfulness. Remember, the Hebrew idea of faith is not something we have. It's something we live. It is imunah. We walk in faithfulness that we have been transformed. And then we can blaspheme. Jesus says that blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is the most is an unpardonable sin. After years of study, In years of prayer, I believe that we blaspheme the Holy Spirit when we say that Jesus is not God or when we say that we know the truth of Jesus and we live as though he is not God. And Jesus places a heavy weight on blasphemy. Dear friends, we can grieve, we can quench, and we can blaspheme God. And he is just there with loving kindness saying, return to me. We must become a people of the book. A people who know the heart and the thoughts of God. A people in relationship with him through prayer and through his word. To understand the infinite and the divine wisdom of God and allow it to continually transform my life. And might I dare say that God knew that that would be what is very best for you. Are you lonely? Have you lost your way? 
They have issues with anger, self-righteousness. The Center for Bible Engagement does this study. They decided to see what would happen in people's lives if they, just, if they would just read the book. And this study ended up giving them some fascinating data that they, they weren't ready for. If you read your Bible one day a week, so we'll count today, lucky you, hashtag you're welcome. Okay, if you read your Bible one day a week, nothing happens. Nothing. There's no change. Zero change. If you read your Bibles two days a week, bad news, still no change. Nothing. They were blown away by this. There no, no, people's lives were not changed being in the Word of God two days a week. Three days. What if you did three days a week being in the Word of God? Listen, I'm not telling you to write a commentary. I'm telling you just sit with Jesus. Open the Word of God and say, transform me today. What truth do you have for me today? Three days a week. There was a subtle blip in their statistics, but it wasn't measurable. It was, it was noticeable, but not measurable. Does that make sense? On day four, four days in the Word of God, dear friends, I'm just asking you, will you just read the Word of God every other day? Okay, it's like, is the pastor he's supposed to tell me to do it every day? I know, but I'm just telling you, the data says if you will just be in the Word of God every other day, this is what happens. The feeling lonely drops by 30%. Some of y'all ain't lonely, you're just not in the Word of God. I know that hurts. I'm not here to be offensive, okay? It breaks my heart because he doesn't want you to feel lonely. He doesn't want you to feel like your life doesn't have purpose. He doesn't want you to feel like you're doing this all alone. Anger drops by 32%. So let that sit. You're dealing with frustration and you're dealing with anger. And the word of God would transform and remove that from your life. Bitterness. And this was bitterness in every category. Marriage and children. Now, do any of us know anything about that? You know what I'm saying? Well, all us men, we married perfect wives. We don't even understand what this means. Marriage, kids, work, and extended family. Drops by 40%. Alcoholism, do you see that number? Drops by 57%. People who are in the Word of God every other day. The Word of God has the power to break the addiction bondage in your life. It'll break those chains and bring freedom to your life. I don't care if it's alcohol. I don't care if it's weed. I don't care if it's pornography. I don't care if it's food. The Word of God has the power to break addiction in our lives. Almost 60%. Four days a week, every other day. I don't have purpose, Ronnie. Pastor Ronnie, I don't know what God wants me to do. I just feel so spiritually stagnant. Dear friends, and I'm just going to ask you, get in the Word of God every other day, and it drops by 60%. Viewing pornography drops by 60%. 1%. That would suggest that you cannot let your eyes wander while they're also on the sacred text of the Word of God. And here's some good stuff. This is the, this is the pastor good stuff. <laughs> if you get in the Word of God four days a week, this is what also happens. Sharing your faith jumps by 200%. Pastor Ronnie, I don't have the gift of evangelism. You don't. You just need to be in the Word of God every other day. <laughs> 200%. People having the desire to disciple others and to be discipled by somebody. There's a lot of good people in the church that are like, oh, I disciple people. Who's discipling you? If you think you're too spiritually mature to be discipled, then you do not understand the way of Jesus. And I mean somebody who will keep you accountable. Someone who will tell you when you're wrong. Someone that you can walk in submission to. If you ain't got that, you ain't got the whole thing. Discipling others and being discipled by someone four days a week, every other day in the word of God, and you desire to be discipled increases by 230%. And then this one just blows my mind. The desire to memorize scripture 
and to hide the word of God in my heart increases by 407% if I would just read the Bible every other day. Store the word of God in your heart. I'm going to give you the three most famous verses in all of Scripture. And I'm going to unpack them briefly as our worship team comes. And then we're going to respond in communion. For God so loved the world. Oh, just the elect in the world? Oh, no, it doesn't say that, does it? Some in the world? The righteous in the world? No, 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 no. Don't believe that hogwash theology. For God so loved the world. Yes, the neighbor you can't stand. Yes, the boss that you don't even think deserves the grace of Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That whoever, who? Whoever. (laughs) What about that person that's confused sexually? Whoever. What about that guy that's broken more rules and more laws and been in and out of jail more times than he can count? Whoever. What about that woman that's so worried about what other people think about herself that she can't even see the goodness of God in her own life? Whoever. What about that person that's so far from God, there's no way they would ever hear the voice of God. Whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The King James says, everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through Jesus, the world might be saved. It's not condemnation. When you are sharing your faith with your friends, when you're sharing your faith with those that you love, when they're trying to figure out, well, if I give myself to Jesus, I have to give this up. If I give myself to Jesus, I'm going to have to let this go. You tell them, dear friend, he did not come to condemn you. He came to love you. Why? Verse 18. Whosoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Do you know him? Like, do you know him? There's no biblical example of some prayer to pray. There's no biblical example of the right words to say. There's this journey of faith, but it starts with surrender. It starts with saying, I can't do this on my own. It starts with saying, I've tried to do this. I've tried. I can't do it anymore. Dear friend, if you're here in the house this morning and you've never surrendered your heart and life to Jesus, it's really just simple. Right where you're sitting, will you just say, Jesus, you can have me. Say, take me. And my brokenness and my confusion and my frustration, you can have me. Dear friends, the sacred text is this, that God loves you and he's for you and it cost him greatly to bring you into right relationship with him. God sent his son to the world so that we could be saved. The word saved in the Greek is an interesting word. The word is sozo. It it means to be made whole. It, It means completeless. In the Hebraic idea, this Greek word would mean shalom. He came to bring peace to your chaos. It's on the very first page of the book. It's the God of order bringing peace to chaos. And his desire is to bring peace to the chaos of your life. And the only way you'll discover that is by living in the sacred text of the Holy Bible.